The bottom line is that 30 to 40 percent of cancers are preventable. And there are simple things that people can do to reduce your risk of getting cancer. In this episode, I sit down with Dr. Paul Merrick, a founding member of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, FLCCC, and former chief of pulmonary and critical care medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Cancer's big business. It's highly profitable. The average cost of chemotherapy for a patient is probably $100,000. He's the author of Cancer Care, the role of repurposed drugs and metabolic interventions in treating cancer. In this episode, he breaks down his key findings. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelly. Dr. Paul Merrick, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for inviting me back again. So when we spoke last, some months ago, on a proper American Thought Leaders show, I'm not talking about the quick hit we did earlier about this new groundbreaking nature study, which I'll recommend our, our viewers watch if they haven't seen that yet. You were looking into cancer treatment, cancer prevention. You had discovered that in the scientific literature, well-established, there's a whole body of literature that you, you know, incredibly well-published medical professional, um, you know, in the industry for, for decades, were just simply unaware of. <laughs> And we were talking about how astonishing that was. And you have since turned that into a book, a kind of monograph. Um, and, and what you found is, I'll use that word again, absolutely astonishing. So why don't you just tell me what you discovered? Yeah, so this was by accident. And I, I certainly didn't know this information three or four years ago. You know, obviously, you know, COVID opened up our eyes and it started this quest about looking at repurposed drugs and alternative therapies. So the bottom line is that 30 to 40 percent of cancers are preventable just through simple lifestyle changes and through supplements, you can reduce your risk of getting cancer, which is really important because about 10 million people on the planet die of cancer every year. Approximately 600,000 Americans die of cancer every year. And cancer will become the most important cause of death. It's gonna affect one in two men and one in three women. So it is a very common disease. And there are simple things that people can do to, to reduce your risk of getting cancer. And this is well published, you know, it's, it's just been, hidden in the literature. It's really important. And then similarly, there are very simple, effective measures that people who have cancer can take to improve the quality of their life and to, to increase the risk of their chances of going into a remission. And these are simple lifestyle changes, dietary changes, and the use of many of, of, of over-the-counter supplements. You know, Go, I'm going to take myself back uh, some years, and uh, I remember I watched this documentary uh, about a Dr. Burdzinski from uh, uh, Texas. Actually, in Polish, you would say his name Burdzinski, <laughs> but that's how I always thought it. But, you know, it was a very interesting documentary because it chronicled a doctor who has been in practice for decades. He had found, according to the documentary, uh, something called an antineoplaston, a, a way to treat cancer. Um, and he had a clinic that he developed and which was ostensibly successful. All sorts of people, industry, government have been trying to shut him down for decades, but it, were unable to do so and he continued on. And he became this place where sort of, you know, lost ca cases which were untreatable. Someone might say, oh, you could go and maybe you could try there. I've heard it helped a few people, right? And And I guess the message of the documentary also was that industry didn't want to validate his findings because he owned the patents. That was the premise and, and, they, and they didn't like that. So <laughs> at the time I thought, oh, this, this seems very compelling. And, but you know, and I, I just kind of left it at that. But now hearing everything that you're saying, this whole picture takes on a whole new meaning to me. I mean, you know, you, we, we talked about diabetes, right? And there's, you know, basically treatments for type two diabetes that have no side effect or very few side effects and, and are actually also also work very well. And but again, 
largely unknown, right, by the by the broader medical community. And this, how many in how many areas is this actually the case? You dug into cancer, so how how many methods are there that that are actually could work that we've been told are some kind of snake oil or dangerous or problematic? Yeah. You know. So obviously, you know, cancer's big business. Uh, it, it's highly profitable. The average cost of chemotherapy for a patient is probably a hundred thousand dollars. So, so you know, big pharma makes a lot of money. The oncologists in this country make a lot of money, and the drugs we're talking about are cheap, off-patent drugs. So you can understand why the you can understand the narrative. It's much like COVID. It, it's, it goes against big pharma and it goes against traditional medicine, which is a tragedy because they're very effective therapies that can really improve the patient's outcome. And some of these can be used in conjunction with standard chemotherapy. As we're not saying that, you know, throw away standard therapy. These can use, be used as adjuncts uh, and as supplements to standard chemotherapy if patients so choose. And I was stunned recently to, to discover that, that MD Anderson Hospital, which is probably one of the biggest cancer hospitals in the world, indeed has an integrative oncology program where they, they advise and they recommend and they coach patients in comprehensive lifestyle changes. And just these lifestyle changes, you know, which include relaxation therapy, sleep, you know, uh, improved diet, improved relationships, exercise, can significantly reduce the risk of patients dying of cancer. I mean, it's an astonishing finding. Well, and, and, and there seems to be actually applying, uh, applying it, I guess, in, 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 in isolated cases, but it's somehow in the collective understanding of how the disease needs to be dealt with, it's just not yeah. really there. No. So, you know, you go to a traditional oncologist and the patient says, would ask, you know, what dietary advice would you give me? And the oncologist will say, well, diet has nothing to do with it. You can eat whatever you want to. And we know that's just simply wrong. There, there's overwhelming scientific data that specific dietary interventions can have a profound effect on cancer, profound effect. And so this is a, you know, this is, this is challenging the standard narrative. Um, so Brzezinski, is, is this a real therapy or what do you think? Yeah, I think it's real. You know, the, it's been subject to, to, to scrutiny. And I think, you know, we, we should be transparent and open. So from my understanding, it seems to be an effective treatment for, for cancer. I don't understand all the biochemistry, but it doesn't mean we can't study it. It doesn't mean that it should be outlawed by the FDA. I think it should be investigated. There's a lot of cancer therapies have extreme side effects. I mean, radiation, chemotherapy, right? This, there's serious quality of life issues with these therapies. On the other hand, these antineoplastons, vitamin D, I'm not saying, you know, they may not be a panacea, I don't know, but the point is they don't have, they're not associated with these types of dramatic reductions in, in quality of life. So, uh, I mean, th that should be part of the equation, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, many patients, in many patients, the treatment of the disease is worse than the disease. And we know the extreme toxicity of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And, you know, these antineoplastons seem pretty benign. And, you know, all of the repurposed drugs that we recommend are extremely safe and effective. What does the patient have to lose? <laughs> you know, the question right. is where you, you, you have an intervention which is cheap, safe and possibly could completely change the directory of the trajectory of the patient's disease, what do you have to lose? A few times when we talked about COVID in the past, we talked about vitamin D. Vitamin D seems to be this, you know, <laughs> miracle vitamin. I don't, I don't know if that's, but it, you know, affects the immune system significantly in conjunction with some other um, supplements, I suppose. Um, but it also 
seems to, from what you're saying, seems to have a positive impact on cancer, not just COVID. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so the vitamin D truly is an astonishing vitamin, which more should be a hormone. As we know, it's very effective for COVID. It's effective for depression. It's effective for Alzheimer's disease. It's effective for diabetes. And it just so happens it's highly effective in both the prevention and treatment of cancer. There's overwhelming data that patients who are vitamin D deficient have a much higher risk of developing cancer. And as we know, as, as you go further from the equator and you get less ultraviolet B and you get less vitamin D, your risk of cancer goes up. Your risk of Alzheimer's goes up. And there's really good data if you take patients, if you give patients vitamin D, you reduce their risk of getting cancer. And patients who have cancer, if you give them high dose vitamin D, it significantly improves their chances of going into a remission. And this is a simple over-the-counter medication. Presumably some of these things could also be used in combination. I mean, you could do a diet change. You could do uh, vitamin D, and you could also do chemo at the same time. That should help you, right? Or is Absolutely. That, so what yeah. you say is true. These things work much better in synergy when they're done together. So, for example, one of the things we recommend is intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. It's been shown in the literature in the oncology literature, if that you do time-restricted feeding at the t same time you're doing chemotherapy, you get a much better response. Mm. So there's absolutely no reason, there's absolutely no reason that, that if patients are undergoing standard you know, chemotherapy, that it should not be combined with these supplemental or complementary techniques that can only enhance the patient's response to therapy. One of the big findings in your monograph is that, or you, you essentially believe cancer to be a metabolic disease. Now that is not, I would say, the conventional wisdom, is it? Yeah. So what you say is true. It's uh, I, you know this is based on the the work of Dr. Siegfried. You know he's done. I mean this is his area of expertise. He's written, you know, hundreds of papers. He's written a book on cancer as a metabolic disease, which basically challenges the conventional wisdom that cancer is due to a chromosomal mutation. Mm -hmm. And so that has a profound implication because if, if it's a chromosomal disease, then the current chemotherapy does make, it fits with that narrative. Mm -hmm. But if cancer is a metabolic disease, then the standard approach is not going to work. And there's overwhelming evidence. I mean, there's overwhelming evidence in the literature that, that, it's, not a meta, that it's not a chromosomal disease. It's a metabolic disease. In fact, the, um, the person who, who, who discovered DNA, you know, uh, Watson and Crick, you know, Dr. Watson has basically said in, a, in an op-ed that he doesn't think cancer is a chromosomal disease and we should look at the metabolic changes that happen in cancer. Well, I guess the question is, couldn't it be both? Like, couldn't there be genetic, you know, mutations? I mean, we, I think that we know that mut it's mutations that actually cause cancer effectively, right? But the question is, how does that happen? And couldn't both mechanisms be right. Yeah, so you're right. There is a complex interplay between metabolism and genetics. We know there are some genetic predisposition. For example, we know that women with the BRCA gene have a much higher risk of developing cancer. But what's interesting is the risk of getting cancer nowadays is about 60 or 70 percent of getting breast cancer. 30 or 40 years ago, it was 40 percent. So it does illustrate that it's an interplay between, mm -hmm. you know, environmental and lifestyle changes and genetics. But most, it's, the current thinking is maybe 5 percent of cancers are due to chromosomal or genetic defects. It appears that um, most cancers are, are not genetically determined. 
there's been an increase, right, in a variety, a significant increase in a variety of metabolic diseases to my eye. I have not studied this, but I mean, and, and just in general, you know, I guess in America, there's this obesity epidemic, and right? I'm sure that actually has a significant impact on, on uh, obviously on metabolism. How could it not, right, I suppose. But what did you find are the kind of core kind of causes yeah. in your understanding? So there's a yeah. strong link between obesity, insulin resistance, and cancer probably underlies 30 or 40 percent of of cancers are due to obesity and insulin resistance. There's a very strong association. And so there's an association between the intake of of high glycemic index foods and sugar beverages and um, and cancer because of its effect on insulin resistance. So so th there's overwhelming data, and as the incidence of obviously obesity is increasing, so it seems in parallel the incidence of cancer is increasing. And then obviously there's the problem of, you know, environmental carcinogens, just on, to layer on top of, on top of this problem. Over the past years, I've noticed um, an increasing perspective. It, 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 I, I, I suspect it must also be in the literature, but certainly among um, in the health related discourse in media and so forth, that obesity is more a, more a genetic disease than a lifestyle disease. Yeah, I don't think that's true because people's genes haven't changed much over the last 30 or 40 years. But if you look at the incidence of obesity, particularly in the US, it's, com it's increased exponentially. So it, it is a lifestyle disease. You know, like most things, there may be a genetic predisposition, but I think without question of doubt that obesity is, is a lifestyle problem because we eat processed foods and foods high, high in carbohydrates and glucose. And we snack all the time. You know, Western people tend to eat all the time rather than doing what our forefathers did, you know, eat one or two meals a day. So Western people eat all the time. They eat highly processed foods, high in carbohydrates and glucose. Uh, in essence, we are, have become, you know, processed food addicts. Does it make sense to say that, you know, if you just focused on the obesity issue, you could, you would deal with a whole bunch of these other issues, perhaps even cancer, based on what you said earlier? Yeah, so I think fundamentally, lifestyle change, which, which would start off with diet, and then exercise, and then sleep. If you if you attack those problems, I think you could eliminate almost all the chronic diseases of Western society, which would be cancer, cardiac disease, Alzheimer's disease. I think all these chronic diseases are related to bad lifestyle and lifestyle choices. Hmm. So you don't think it has to do with you know increased radiation? That's one of the things you hear right often, or. Um, yeah, I, I think obviously environmental carcinogens are important, you know, and people or families that live near power lines are at an increased risk of certain kinds of cancer. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that it's so pervasive that, you know, pesticides and toxins are so pervasive that it's very difficult for any individual to to completely eliminate. There is good data, though, that people who, who eat um, uh, organic food, they, as organic as can be, have a lower risk of cancer. So there is data showing that if you eat a diet of organic food, your risk of cancer is less. So there are things that you can do, but it's pretty difficult to, you know, not to breathe the air that we're exposed to or drink the water. But um, there's no question that environmental carcinogens have played a role. Okay, so let's say, you know, in order of importance, you found 
a series of lifestyle decisions and perhaps supplements. So let, let's kind of go through that and maybe in order of importance based on your study of the literature. Um, you know, because maybe there's some things that folks watching could like implement right now <laughs> that would that would help them. Yeah. So so I can quote um, a randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard that the Arbury Tower used. So they did a, a, a simple intervention, three things to see what would happen to the risk of cancer. And so it was vitamin D omega-3 fatty acids plus an exercise program. And they showed the combination of all three reduced the risk of cancer by 60%. 60%. So those are very simple things that people can do. So, it, you know, it's a matter of exercising, taking vitamin D, and modifying your diet can significantly reduce your risk of getting cancer. I'm just gonna repeat that for a second. You're saying the combination of vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, and exercise reduced cancer risk by 60%? That's correct. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so that doesn't get a lot of press um, because you can't make money in fact, it's counterproductive for the pharmaceutical industry and the medical complex if people don't get cancer. And so, you know, this, this was published in a peer-reviewed paper, in a peer-reviewed journal. It's a really good study. It's supported by other studies. There are many studies that show that exercise reduces your risk of cancer. There's data that shows that simple relaxation techniques and techniques in, in terms of meditation, yoga, relaxation techniques re improve your outcome if you get cancer. So there are some very simple lifestyle interventions that can re reduce both your risk of getting cancer and if you have cancer, can improve the outcome. Well, I, I'm just going to you know comment on this. Given how prevalent cancer is in our society. I mean, the risk of cancer, and you outlined this a little bit earlier, is high for every person. If you can reduce that by 60%, I mean, we should all be rushing off <laughs> and starting this regimen, never mind other things you're gonna tell us about in a moment. Yeah, so it, it, it doesn't get the attention that it should get. I mean, you know, particularly vitamin D, the, the, the data on vitamin D in preventing cancer, in preventing Alzheimer's disease, in preventing depression is overwhelming. And it's, it's, it's safe, you know, it, it, it's, it's a cheap intervention that has minimal adverse events. And so from my perspective, there's no reason that everybody should, should not be taking vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk a little more briefly about vitamin D. Can you overdose on vitamin D? So you, it is possible, you, you know, if you take mega doses of vitamin D, you, you can get very high levels, which cause high blood calcium levels, which can cause kidney stones. But you have to take exceedingly high levels. So, you know, what we recommend is 10,000 units a day, which seems to be a very safe dose that, it, you know, it, by all standards, it's a very high dose, but the data suggests that 10,000 units a day is safe and, and uh, does not cause toxicity. And you feel comfortable sort of advising this on camera to a broad group of people based on your understanding of the literature? Yeah, so I think between five and 10,000 units a day, depending on your particular scenario, makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's, there's really good data for, so, you know, patients with cancer, patients with depression, we would recommend maybe 10,000 units, you know, as a prophylaxis for, for people, 5,000 units a day is a very safe dose. And again, I'll just mention, this also is a COVID prevention, even, I suppose, in a situation where people have been, let's say, overly boosted and therefore, you know, more susceptible to being infected, this, this would still help. There's no problem to take vitamin D and, and protect yourself. Yeah, I mean, vitamin D has enormous immunological effects. It affects gene expression. There are hundreds of genes that are affected by vitamin D. And there's really, you know, excellent data 
that um, vitamin D reduces your risk of getting COVID. And if you get COVID, it reduces the severity of the disease. So your chances of being hospitalized or dying are much less. So, you know, what we should have been, what we should have done, you know, with the, with the COVID pandemic, if it was a pandemic, was we, we should have been boosting people's vitamin D level, particularly the elderly who, you know, are in old age homes or elderly homes so they don't get much sunshine and are certainly vitamin D deficient. You know, instead of, you know, vaccinating them, we would have done a much greater service to, to the population if we'd just given them vitamin D. Well, and also what comes to mind, I've discussed this on a number of programs, is people with darker skin in northern climates don't synthesize as much. So they may have even lower levels of vitamin D and not realizing it. So there's another, you know, very valuable use. Case. Yes. So, yeah. you know, elderly people don't make vitamin D well. Um, obese people don't make vitamin D. People of dark skin don't make vitamin D. So there's certain groups that are even, it's even more important to take vitamin D. Is there anything else vitamin D is good for? <laughs> well, it's, you know, there's nothing that it's bad for unless the only thing is it can be bad for is if you have high blood calcium. So if you, if you have hypercalcemia, for whatever reason, you wouldn't want to take vitamin D. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's very safe. You mentioned something about addiction to food, and I suspect that a lot of people, you know, I even just sort of, I'll, I'll mention this anecdotally. Um, I actually, uh, I was told recently a story about someone who was working in the food industry, broadly speaking, who quit at one point because she realized that she, her job was basically to make food more addictive. Yeah, okay. so there's no question that processed food there, there's a pervasive addiction to processed food. And basically, the sugar and fructose causes a high that then stimulates the appetite and it becomes self-serving because the more you eat, the more you want to eat. And then you become, your blood glucose goes up and you develop uh, insulin resistance. And so people are addicted. There's animal data that shows that glucose is more addictive to, to mice than cocaine or heroin. Say that again? <laughs> yeah, animal data suggests that glucose. Like sugar. Like sugar. Yeah. Like sweetened beverages. Yeah. Is more addictive to, to experimental animals than cocaine. It right. causes such a high. And of course, we, we're we're not allowed to run those experiments on humans. Um, wow. So th there's no question that a large segment of the Western population are addicted to processed foods and just by switching to real food. And so, you know, if it looks like food, it's food. You know, if it comes in a carton or has a wrapper and it has a, a package insert or a a list of ingredients and preservatives and chemicals, then it's not real food. So just by changing your diet to real food can make an enormous difference. You know, it's very interesting because one of the things that I, I've done keto dieting for a long time, and you just the moment you start doing it, it actually becomes very normal. You just have to kind of overcome uh, uh, the initial kind of desire to, to, to eat the sugary things, but after a while it's, it's, it's not an issue at all. But I, I've often told people, I think the reason it actually works is because you just can't eat most processed things if you're eating keto. You just, it's just not, not an option for you. Yeah, so right? once, yeah. once you become adapted to eating real food, e eating processed food becomes very difficult. It just becomes you know, unappetizing and it doesn't have the same appeal. And so that, that's why it's not a difficult thing to do. You know, it should be a lifestyle change, not a diet. And so once you, you start eating real food, then um, the processed food becomes unappetizing. Oh, it's still nice to have that, you know, that burger <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's okay to cheat now and then. Uh, let me uh, ask you about this. So, you know, I, I myself do a lot of meditation. It's been incredibly helpful to me. Um, at the same time, 
I can disclose I don't get a ton of sleep. And and so I, and what, so what what is the cost of that or or what what is the right amount of sleep in this sort of broad of course it's going to be different for different people but you mentioned that as something that's important. So sleep yeah. is really important for brain restoration mm -hmm. and f so there's something called the glymphatic system which is the way the brain detoxifies itself during sleep. It's, 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 it's like the lymphatic system of the brain, but it's only active during sleep. Mm. And so we know that people that are sleep deprived, it reduces your life expectancy. It increases your risk of cancer. Mm. So it's really important that people, you know, people have the idea that they can get away with five or six hours of sleep and it doesn't affect their their health. That is not true. The data is clear that people who, who you know, an adult needs at least seven hours of sleep. And s interference with sleep, in, you know, increases your risk of many diseases, including, you know, dementia. And there's data that people who have cancer, who actually have um, sleep dysfunction, have a much higher risk of, of demising. Absolutely fascinating. What about you know, you mentioned some repurposed drugs and so forth uh, for, for use with cancer that are not generally known. Yeah, so there, there, there's a, there's, there, there is a group called Redo, which looks at repurposed drugs for the use of cancer. So they list about 250 different drugs, believe it or not, that have shown, you know, in experimental models to have activity against cancer cells. In the book or monograph that I wrote, I reduced them down to the 30 that I thought was the most effective. And so there are really good studies showing that, that um, both in a test tube, in an in, in a, um, animal model, as well as in patients, that it has anti-cancer activity. And there's, there's a list of these. You know, so vitamin D is, is, is number one, but then we have melatonin, we have green tea, um, the anti-diabetic me medication metformin actually is a very powerful uh, anti-cancer drug. And then we have the antiparasitic drugs. There's mebendazole, uh, ivermectin, mm -hmm. that, that ha have activity against um, cancer cells. Mm. Um, this, this is, I was going to say the, ho the horse dewormer. <laughs> so believe it or not, Sorry. <laughs> Believe it or not, the horse dewormer is very effective against certain cancers. And so we know of, of cases of patients who had solid tumors who were given the horse dewormer and the, together with some other drugs. So, you know, as I said, it's not one, one magical drug. It's a combination. It's a combination approach. But we're given a regimen which included the horse dewormer and the cancer disappeared. Oh, absolutely fascinating. You know, it, just, it also struck me, you know, there, there's no reason why you, can, you couldn't have your vitamin D, have your matcha. I love, I probably drink matcha every day, you know, uh, you know, concentrated green tea in the powder and, and mel melatonin or other things are also very kind of innocuous. Um, yes. So, the, the, you know, the bottom line is, you know, there are some patients who would choose this approach rather than undergoing chemotherapy or radiotherapy, particularly for cancers that are not responsive to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you can use this, them as adjuncts to chemotherapy so that in the end you need less chemotherapy. And the data is clear that the combination is more effective than chemotherapy alone. Mm. So, you know, this is, this is, I think, the point. You kind of have to approach any treatment these days skeptically, any treatment regimen. You really have to, I'm going to say the, 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 the terrible term, do your own research, <laughs> right? This was, became something that you're not allowed to say, right, over, over the last few years. It, 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 Absolutely. I think the bottom line is patients must be empowered. They need to be empowered by the truth and they should do their own research. I think the days are, are gone where you trust sorry, I'm sorry to say this, you trust implicitly what the physician says, particularly 
the oncologist in this country. So in some European countries, the oncologists or integrative oncologists, they follow, you know, particularly in Europe, they'll use a combination of standard therapy plus unconventional, what would be considered unconventional. But it happens in the same hospital. Um, in this country, they, you know, almost all oncologists will just follow chemotherapy. So I think that patients... But with the, with the exception of this, of this one, which probably in many cases would, but has this whole integrative... Yeah, so it is interesting. So they, they do, they focus on lifestyle interventions as part of it. They don't look at repurposed drugs or other dietary manipulations. So there is, there, I was surprised that they actually do have such a program, uh, which is really, which is fantastic. But it should be much, it should be the standard of care that patients should follow in, you know, comprehensive lifestyle changes, as well as, you know, I would say, you know, repurposed drugs. How many papers did you look at for this monograph? Yeah, so I looked at over 1,400 different peer-reviewed papers. Um, so I think I have a pretty good understanding of the literature. And this data is out there. This data is published. I mean, there's really good data, for example, showing that um, controlling your diet, if you have colorectal cancer and have surgery and you control your diet so that you control your glucose, your risk of getting a metastasis and dying of a metastasis is much less. And this is in the oncology literature. So the, the data is out there. Um, that's why patients have to do their own research. And, you know, which is what I try to do in my book is to really compile all the data out there in a place that patients can read and then decide, you know, what they think it is it would be fit in with their lifestyle. Over the last few years, and our viewers can you know, look back to some of our previous interviews, you know, <laughs> I mean, you started out as a, you know, running an emergency room, a big emergency room. And of course, and you also developed this, uh, the vitamin C sepsis protocol, which is, you know, have now been vindicated. We've talked about that before. I think you've published over 500 papers, but not really focused on cancer. <laughs> Why should people trust this? Yes. People would say, stay in your lane, Dr. Merrick. Yes, yeah, so I have been asked a question, and that, that is a good question. So firstly, it was ICU, not emergency medicine, just although it's a small point. So the, the reason is, is that I, I have no stake in the game that I'm, I'm not going to, I have no conflict of interest. I can objectively look at the literature. And so that's what I've done in my, most of my career is objectively looked at the literature and come up with treatment plans. So I, I'm, I have no conflicts here. I can objectively look at the scientific data and I can assimilate the data and I can compile the data. And so that's what I did. <laughs> You know, I'm not claiming to be an oncologist. I'm just presenting the data that's out there. All I'm doing is I compile the data that's out there. And because I have no conflict of interest, I have no skin in the game, I can be honest and objective and transparent. And so if people don't think it's true, well, let them decide for themselves. But, you know, obviously I've looked at the literature and I'm presenting it as honestly and as scientifically as I can. Well, and the reason I mentioned, you know, the number of papers you have published, and of course, you know, sepsis is this huge problem in, frankly, any hospital. It's a significant cause of death in any hospital. You develop protocols that were better and cheap and can be applied, you know, almost anywhere in the world, you know, in places where they don't have, you know, terribly great hospital facilities. I guess, I guess I'm trying to say is you've, you've done a lot of thinking about how to <laughs> treat people and help make them better, including uh, during COVID. In fact, that is actually what cost you your, your career as in, you know, running the ICU because you refused to use these protocols, which we now know were terrible, right? And, and you applied, you tried to do something better, which indeed it worked. Yeah, so I so, think... COVID basically opened my eyes, to be honest. You know, I, I followed the narrative 
previously. And then I realized that there was another story. There was another side to the story. And I think the diabetes and the cancer treatment is a good illustration that there is another side. The data is out there. It just needs to be brought to the surface. Oh, great. So where can people find this cancer monograph of yours? Yeah, so two places. They can go to the FLCCC website. So that's flccc.net, and they can download it for free. Or you can buy the book, the monograph, at, on Amazon.com. Well, wonderful. Well, any final thoughts as we finish? Yeah, I think that people need to be empowered to improve their own health that I think cancer is largely a preventable disease and that people should do what they can so they don't get cancer. It's as simple as that. <laughs> well, Dr. Paul Merrick, it's so good to have you on again. Thank you, Jan. It's always a pleasure. Thank you all for joining Dr. Paul Merrick and me on this episode of American Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Janja Kellek. Mm -hmm.